Okay, so far on our show, I've made four claims. Number one, because of the cases like the cases I've just shown you, Americans believe money buys results in Congress. 75% of Americans in a poll we just conducted a couple months ago believe that. A little bit more Democrats than Republicans, but I can tell you from polling that we did before the change in control of Congress in the old days, more Republicans than Democrats. But regardless of the details, the bottom line is clear. The vast majority of Americans believe money buys results in Congress. Number two, that belief erodes trust. The last poll Gallup had of confidence in Congress found that 11% of Americans have confidence in Congress. 11%. Now we should put that in some context. There were more people who believed in the British crown at the time of the revolution than who believe in our Congress today. And number three, this low trust erodes people's participation in the system. Rock the Vote, the youth organization that, uh, that gets people um, registered to vote and turned out the largest number of young voters in the last election easily enough to claim credit for selecting Obama as the president. Rock the Vote surveyed their members before the 2010 midterm elections because so many had indicated they were not going to vote. And they asked, why aren't you voting? And the number one reason given by far, two to one over the second highest reason was, quote, no matter who wins, corporate interests will still have too much power and prevent real change. And that view is not just a view of kids. The vast majority of people who could have voted didn't vote because my view is of this belief. Why waste your time if it will have no effect. And number four, we should understand this as a function of an improper dependence that has been secreted into our system of governance. We should understand it as a kind of corruption. Okay, continuing then. Now I want to give you a word, independence, and I want to steer you away from your first association with that word so few days after July 4th, the independence of 1776. That's not the independence I'm talking about. I'm talking about the idea of independence that was in Americans' minds around 1786, just a few years before we ratified our Constitution, at a time when most Americans believed that America was going to be a failure when a certain lack of independence pervaded state legislatures and improper dependence throughout state legislatures, a dependence upon the wrong kind of influence that corrupted the work of state legislatures. Our framers were obsessed with this idea of improper dependence. So was uh, Jane Austen, but our framers in particular we're obsessed with the problem of improper dependence. Jefferson wrote in his notes in Virginia, dependence begets subservience and venality. It suffocates the germ of virtue and prepares fit tools for the designs of ambitions. This is what government had become. And our founders sought a non-dependent, independent form of government that could get the right answer for the right reason. Their common aim was a set of institutions, we could call them constitutions, against improper dependence. But what it means to be against improper dependence is to be in favor of proper dependence. We secure ourselves against the wrong temptations by securing ourselves in favor of the right incentives. So for example, we talk about an independent judiciary, but that does not mean a judiciary that gets to do whatever the hell they want. It means a judiciary dependent upon the law, tied to the law, and therefore able to resist 
temptations to politics or temptations to money. It's the proper dependence, our framers thought, which would guarantee the independence our government needs. So, when the framers met to give us what they called a republic, what they meant by a republic was, as the Federalist Papers described, a representative democracy. An independent democracy in the sense of a properly dependent representative democracy. So the Federalists described in Federalist 52 that Congress was to be that department which was dependent upon the people alone, dependent upon the people alone, to make sure that idea is clear. So their model was something like this. I do my own graphics. That's pretty cool, right? Watch the way that bounces. <laughs> Congress, the marionette, the controller, we, the people. But the problem, of course, is that Congress has evolved a different dependence inside that system of influence, a dependence not just upon the people, but increasingly a dependence upon the funders. If, as I told you, members spend between 30 and 70 percent of their time raising money to get to Congress or to get their party back into control, that means they develop a sixth sense, a constant awareness of how what they do might affect their ability to raise money to get back into Congress. They become shape shifters as they constantly adjust their view of what the right answer is in light of their understanding of what the right way to raise money is. As Leslie Byrne, a Democrat from Virginia, described, when she first went to Congress, she was told by a colleague, quote, always lean to the green. And then to clarify, she said, he was not an environmentalist. <laughs> Now the point is, this too is a dependency. It is a different and conflicting dependency from a dependency upon the people alone. Because the obvious point is, the funders are not the people. Now again, I'm not saying that the funders engage in illegal quid pro quo bribery. That's not the problem. Instead, the funders support the system of distracting and distorting dependency that undermines the intended dependency of our framers. Now, I want to be very precise and very careful and clear out questions and uncertainty that you still might have here. Some people say in response to this argument, well, maybe the funders are the people. Maybe this gap is in fact not a gap at all and instead what we have is the people working together. No, is the answer to that possibility. The surveys we've done of who funds campaigns demonstrates overwhelmingly that the funders are not the people. People who make $75,000 or less, 80% have never given to any political campaign. People who make $75,000 or more, 80% do regularly give to political campaigns. Those two groups are radically disconnected. And the, and the people who raise the money recognize that disconnection. But then some people say, well, maybe the members ignore the funders and just follow what the people want, not what the funders want. Again, the answer is no to that possibility. Extraordinary work by Professor Martin Guilens at Princeton, who surveyed some 1,500 different public opinion surveys where he could tell the difference between the very top segment of our society, top 10% of the public, and the rest of the society, 90%. He took of those 1,500 surveys, some 887, where the top 10% disagreed with the bottom 90%. And the question was, when there was a conflict between the top 10%, and in my argument here, I'm saying the top 10% is the proxy for the funders, and the top 10% disagreed with the bottom 90%, what did Congress do? And the answer is... When Americans with different income levels differ in their policy preferences, actual policy outcomes strongly reflect the preferences of the most affluent, but bear virtually no relationship to the preferences of the poor or middle-income Americans. There is, as he describes, a vast discrepancy between what our government would be doing if our government were doing what the framers said and what our government does in a world where our government follows what the funders want. 
And it's not a difference explained by education. As sad as this is for a professor, the truth is you don't get to be rich by being smart. The top 10% are not necessarily the top 10% in intelligence. This is just influence that gets reflected because the system magnifies the influence of wealth when wealth drives contributions to campaigns. This much I think we know. Number one, Congress is dependent upon the funders. Number two, they follow the policy that the funders want. And number three, therefore, the framers intended dependence upon the people has been corrupted. That what we need in this July 4th week is not so much a declaration of independence as much as a declaration for independence. A declaration for the idea that we need a Congress that is independent, which means a Congress that is properly dependent upon the people as opposed to any other corrupting influence. Now, some people listen to this they look at law professor from Harvard and think, this must be an issue people on the left care about. And people on the left do care about this issue. But what I want to convince you of now is that if you're on the right, you should care about this issue just as much, probably more. Right? So think back to the great reviver of the right, Ronald Reagan, and I'll confess, don't tell anybody, but I'll confess, that when I was a young kid, 1980, I was the youngest member of a delegation that went to the Republican National Convention and nominated Ronald Reagan to be our nominee. I was a rabid Reaganite. I grew up, but when I was young, <laughs> that was my view. And of course, what Reagan articulated was a particular fear, a fear of government spinning out of control. And he had a cause in his mind about what the reason for this spinning out of control would be. It was both internal and external. Internal, the cause was bureaucrats, constantly meddling, trying to expand the scope of government's regulatory reach. And external, it was much more profound, as Reagan put it, quoting who he said was Alexander Titler, but it's probably, there was probably no such person as Alexander Titler, but it's a famous quote. He said, a democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until the voters discover they can vote themselves largesse out of the public treasury. From that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidate promising the most benefits from the treasury, with the result that democracy always collapses over loose fiscal policy. Okay, so Reagan points to the bureaucrats and the mobs that would drive government growth and eventual bankruptcy of our country. Now, he was probably right in the sense of correct about growth and bankruptcy, right? We've seen enormous growth in the size of governments, and right now, of course, peaking at about uh, $2.7 trillion in the total amount that our government will consume. And it's probably true to say we've entered a stage of fiscal bankruptcy, as we see that the amount of deficit being produced by the current level of spending and lack of tax revenue uh, produces what is technically a bankrupt country, and this is not a bipartisan point. It happens under both congressional leadership of Democrats or Republicans, and we will reach now deficits that we have never in the United States history seen before. So he was right. Growth and bankruptcy were the future of this democracy. But the question I want you to focus on is, was it bureaucrats and mobs that produced this problem? Are they the cause? We consider some examples. Number one, when we think about the internet and you hope to get fast internet service, that comes from broadband internet connections. And broadband can come either across your telephone lines or across your cable connection. And in the way the world got regulated in telecommunications policies, the Telecommunications Act dealt very differently with telephone lines and cable connections. 
So Title II of the Telecommunications Act regulated telephone lines and regulated them to be basically like common carriers, meaning had to open themselves up for lots of competition. But cable was regulated more as private monopolies that allowed the cable companies to control whatever access to the lines they wanted to grant. When Al Gore was vice president, Gore had the idea to take these two different broadband regulatory regimes and bring them together under title, what he called seven, that would now regulate both DSL and cable, but regulate them in a new way to deregulate them fundamentally from the way in which they had been regulated before. Very minimal regulations, much less than is being talked about today with network neutrality regulations. And his chief policy person took this idea to the Hill and as he reported back to me, the re reaction of Capitol Hill was quite pronounced in opposition. As they said, hell no. And as it was summarized to me, they said, quote, how are we going to raise money from the telecoms if we deregulate them? How are we going to raise money if we deregulate them? So you are a small government Republican. You want to deregulate our economy. What if this question is in the back of the heads of members of Congress as they have to decide whether to regulate or not? Or here's another example. The Wall Street Journal had this piece from the, at the end of December about the explosion in temporary tax provisions in our tax code. This extender mania begins in the early 1980s and then by the current round it's exploded into hundreds of these temporary tax provisions. And the journal couldn't figure out why exactly this had happened. Now again, this begins with Ronald Reagan. 1981, Reagan proposed the Research and Development Tax Credit. It was advanced as a tax credit which would pay for itself in that it would spur innovation and investment that otherwise wouldn't have been invested. The Democrats were skeptical. So they struck a deal, the Republicans and Democrats. They would make the temporary tax credit temporary. And then after a period of time, they would evaluate, did it work? Well, after the proposed period, economists from both the right and the left concluded overwhelmingly that it did work, that it was a great idea. It was a great tax idea because it spurred investments that wouldn't have been made and it made sense absolutely from the standpoint of proper investment tax policy. But the puzzle is that that temporary tax credit is still temporary. Every couple of years, Congress has to come back and re-extend it. And why is that? Well, as uh, the Institute for Policy Innovation reported in their Tax Bites letter, the reason is Congress allows the credit to lapse until another short extension is given, preceded, of course, by a series of fundraisers and speeches about the importance of nurturing innovation. Congress essentially uses this cycle to raise money for re-election, promising industry more predictability the next time around. This is the same point made by Rebecca Kaisar in this piece, Sun also rises. She says, the principal recipients of the research credit are large US manufacturing corporations. These business entities are more than willing to invest in lobbying activities and campaign donations to ensure continuance of this large tax savings. So again, you're a right wing Republican who wants smaller government and simpler taxes? What if every time Congress is deciding about whether to simplify the taxes, they're thinking in the back of their heads, how are we going to induce people to give money to our campaigns if we simplify taxes? This dynamic, I suggest, is central to how Washington works. They architect tax policy for the point of making it easier to raise campaign contributions. Not the only reason, but the point is a core reason for our tax policy being the way it is, is to guarantee they have the right levers to pull when they need to raise the cash they need to get back into Congress. So if somebody asks, why don't we just eliminate these temporary tax credits? The answer we can imagine coming back in a similar way would be, hell no. How are we going to raise money from the targets if we eliminate these credits? Or finally, one more issue. If I asked you, what was the number one issue that Congress focused on over the last six months? You know, we're in the middle of two wars, huge unemployment crisis. We still haven't addressed properly the financial 
services sector. There's no global warming legislation on the horizon. There's a huge range of extremely important issues from immigration to the deficit to the budget that Congress has not yet resolved. So of all those issues, really important issues to the United States, what was the issue they focused on the most? The answer, as Huffington Post reported in, in uh, May, was the swipe fee controversy. Now, you feel a little bit embarrassed because you don't know what the swipe fee controversy is. Let me tell you what it is. When you use a debit card, the banks get a certain fee. And the retail companies are angry at these swipe fees because they're expensive. And they believe that the swipe fees lead people to use credit cards or debit cards less. So the retail companies want the swipe fees lower. The banks want the swipe fees higher. $16 billion is at stake. 250 lobbyists are on Capitol Hill fighting about this issue, trying to persuade members of Congress to support one side or the other. As one senator put it, puts it, the fights down here can be put into two or three categories. The big greedy bastards against the big greedy bastards, the big greedy bastards against little greedy bastards, and some cases even other little greedy bastards against other little greedy bastards. And so the point is that this system is what Congress adopts to set their agenda. And you say, well, why would Congress waste their time on such tiny little issues? Of course, it's important to the banks, but there are a lot of really important issues out there, like unemployment. Why don't they spend their time dealing with unemployment rather than dealing with something like the bank swipe fees? And the money quote, so to speak, in this article, they almost didn't even notice it, but here's what the article says. The clock never ticks down to zero in Washington. One year's law is next year's repeal target. Politicians showered with cash from card companies and giant retailers alike have been moving back and forth between camps, paid handsomely for their shifting allegiances. So the point is, the agenda that Congress sets for the work it's going to do is driven by its expectation of how much money it gets depending upon the issue it will pick. Why work on unemployment? There's no money in that when you have $16 billion of bank fees that can induce an enormous amount of lobbyist money and campaign contribution. Now the point is, in all three cases, it's the same dynamic. There's a political economy of government. And the question that gets asked again and again maybe not openly, maybe not in the front of their minds, but somewhere in the back of their heads is, how does what we do help us raise our campaign funds? Which means that if you are against more regulation, or complicated taxes, or senseless monopolies inside of our economy, you are from the right, the Ronald Reagan right, the right that I rallied to in 1980, it should be no surprise that as you look over the past uh, 29 years, where 20 years have been controlled by conservative Republican presidents, we still have no smaller government and no simpler taxes on the horizon at all. It's no surprise, because the system for funding campaigns works directly against the interests of people on the right, and works directly against the, people, the interests of the people on the left for different reasons. We don't have, we on the right and we on the left, common objectives, but we have a common enemy. And the common enemy is a system of funding elections which drives our members to worry not about what we on the right or we on the left want, but what we, the lobbyist and campaign funders, need. Okay, now on January 21st, 2010, a year and a day after Barack Obama was sworn into office, the Supreme Court delivered an opinion in the case of Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission, which in my view will make this problem much, much worse. In that decision, the Supreme Court equated the corporation with the person in the sense that it gave the corporation the same right that a person had. And that right was a right that individuals got from a case called Buckley versus Vallejo decided in 1976. After Citizens United, that same right is a right which corporations would have. What is that right? 
It's the right to spend an unlimited amount to support political campaigns as long as those expenditures are independent of the campaign. So independent meaning you can't coordinate openly with the campaign, but if they're independent, you can spend as much as you want. Now this opinion has been criticized, and I think misunderstood. What the Supreme Court did not say was it's because corporations are persons that corporations have this right. That was not their reasoning at all. What the Supreme Court said was there's a First Amendment, and the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law, actually, as the Supreme Court's read it, it's more like Congress shall make not a lot of laws that restrict, abridge the freedom of speech. And this First Amendment is a limitation on the power of Congress. In this case, Citizens United, that limitation benefited corporations, but of course it benefits whoever is benefited by restricting Congress's power to regulate speech. And as I watched the explosion in anger about this decision, I was a little bit puzzled, being a lefty myself. Of course, you know, when the Supreme Court interprets the First Amendment to benefit Nazis or communists or pornographers, we on the left celebrate, hooray, it's free speech, vindicated in America. But when the Supreme Court interprets the First Amendment to benefit corporations, there is outrage everywhere. And it's outrage at an extreme level that is a little bit hard even for those of us who share the criticism to fathom. So here is Oberman on MSNBC. This is a Supreme Court sanctioned murder of what little actual democracy is left in this democracy. It is government of the people, by the corporations, for the corporations. It is the dark ages. It is our Dred Scott. Our Dred Scott, the case that held that blacks could not be citizens because the framers considered them subhuman. It's our Dred Scott. Now that's a little bit of an exaggeration, I think, which is an exaggeration that no African American could ever have articulated. But it just evokes the sense of complete extreme frustration, which our political system has now directed against this idea of corporate participation in our elections. And we should understand that frustration in a certain kind of context. Right? So 2008, the total amount raised and spent in all congressional campaigns together was $1.4 billion. And of that $1.4 billion, about 10% of that money was contributed in contributions of $200 or less. And that amount of money is still small compared with the amount of money spent on lobbyists. In 2009, $3.5 billion was spent on lobbyists in Washington. And of that $3.5 billion, about 1.2% was lobbying on behalf of organized labor. Okay, so here's the money inside of Washington. And the question is, what will Citizens United do? Now the corporations are free to spend whatever they want from their corporate treasury to influence political elections and campaigns. So ask yourself, what does that amount of money look like? So let's say that we took 1% of the corporate profits of the Fortune 400 in 2008. 1%. 1% of the corporate profits devoted now to political speech would be $6.2 billion swamping the total amount that was raised and spent in 2008 by private contributions, and even more than the total amount spent in lobbying. So this is the reason why people are extremely fearful about what Citizens United might do to the way in which we actually run campaigns or to the attention members give to corporations as opposed to the people, making the problem I've described much, much worse. Now the Supreme Court, was pretty confident, sanguine about this, because as they said, there's no problem here because all of these contributions will have to be disclosed. They, in fact, didn't know the law. There's no requirement, actually, of full disclosure. And indeed, whereas in 1990, something like 94% of the independent expenditures that were made there were disclosed in the sense that the contributors were disclosed, by the last election cycle, that number had fallen below 40%. 32% of contributions are actually disclosed in these independent expenditures. So we don't actually know. But even if Congress got around to passing a law that forced disclosure, what the Supreme Court misses is that you actually can't 
No. The influence that's being imposed because of these expenditures. Because there's missing money in the equation. As this paper by uh, Marcus Schumann and Ethan Kaplan describe, they speculate and now have data to support it that there's something like an iceberg effect in political campaigns. What these iceberg effect means is that the value of my contribution to you is equivalent to the threat value to you if I threaten to give your contribution to somebody else. So I could say to you, I'm going to give you $10,000 in your election. They suggest that's the same as if I say to you, I'm going to give you $2,000 and threaten to give your opponent $8,000. You're going to behave in the same way as if I gave you $10,000 directly. But for me, I'd much rather threaten and only have to pay $2,000 than have to pay $10,000 to get you to do what you actually want to do. And the point is, nobody ever has to disclose the threats. The threats aren't disclosed by anybody. The only thing we disclose is what's actually given. And the amount that's threatened but not given would never show up on anybody's disclosure forms about how they've influenced anybody. Now, their paper was written in the days before Citizens United, when the total amount that a corporation could contribute through their PAC was limited at about $10,000 an election cycle. But after Citizens United, when the total amount is unlimited, then the threat value of these contributions is much, much, much greater, producing this much, much more serious problem of this marionette Congress, making something that was bad much, much worse. Okay, so I've talked about a corruption produced by an independent, improper dependency, a dependency upon the funders as opposed to the people. That dependency has certain effects. It distorts our political system and weakens trust in the system. It was bad. It is getting much, much worse. What's the remedy? Well, I think we can start by identifying what we should do by saying what we should not be doing. I think efforts to race out there and reverse Citizens United are deeply misguided. It's a mistake to say we should create a political movement to mis reverse Citizens United, meaning passing a constitutional amendment to reverse Citizens United since it's a Supreme Court decision. It's a mistake for two reasons. Number one, the number 67. To get an amendment to our Constitution, passed requires 67 senators in the United States Senate to sign up. There is no way 67 members of the current or any future United States Senate is, are ever going to sign up to an amendment that reverses Citizens United and cuts back on the influence the corporations might have in our elections. It just ain't going to happen. And number two, even if we did magically get 67 senators to vote to return us back to where we were before Citizens United, even if somehow they passed an amendment that got us from the world of January 21st, 2010, to the world of January 20th, 2010, the critical thing to remember is that our Congress, our democracy, our republic was already broken before Citizens United. And getting us back to the world before Citizens United is not going to get us to a world where the reform is enough to change the underlying corruption that I've been talking about. Instead, the reform we need has got to be to find a way to fix this dependency, this improper dependency, by making it so the funders are the people, rather than the funders being separated from the people. And the model for this change has been suggested by three states across the country, very different states, Arizona, Maine, and Connecticut, who have adopted a kind of public funding system, but it's a voluntary small dollar election system, where candidates voluntarily opt into a system where they will take no more than a small amount of money from any contributor, $100 is the federal limit people are talking about, and then that amount gets multiplied by the government so that $100 at the federal limit would be worth $500 in total contributions. So that no candidate ever takes large contributions, no candidate focuses on anything except small contributions, and therefore the funders get closer 
to being the people. So with small dollar contributions only, if we had a Congress where, like in Connecticut, 88% of members opted into a system where they took small dollar contributions only, then we could begin to believe, when Congress did whatever stupid thing Congress did, we could believe, as we all want to believe, that they did whatever stupid thing they did, maybe because there were too many Democrats, or maybe too, because there were too many Republicans, but not because of the money. A change to a voluntary small dollar contribution system would make trust in the system possible again because it would get us closer to the right kind of dependence that our democracy needs. It would get us closer to the system of independence that our framers had. Now in my own sort of dreamy moments of thinking about the ideal, this is what the promised land looks like to me. I call this the Grant and Franklin's project. Okay, so here's how it works. You have to first assume with me, something I could prove to you, but just assume it for a second, that every one of us voters contributes at least $50 to the federal treasury. At least $50. So some of us contribute through income tax, others through gas tax, some of us contribute through transportation, but whatever, somehow all of us are responsible for at least $50 in the treasury. So take that assumption and say, the first $50 that I contribute to the federal treasury, we convert into a democracy voucher. A voucher which I am allowed to allocate to the appropriate candidates however I want. So I can give $50 to my congressperson or $50 to her opponent or $25 to one and $25 to another. I can allocate it however I want. But I can only allocate it to candidates who promise only to take democracy vouchers to fund their campaigns, plus they're allowed to take contributions of up to $100 from any citizen. So citizens, can, in addition to the democracy voucher, can contribute up to $100, thus the Franklin, the Franklin on the $100 bill and the Grant on the $50 bill. That's the Grants and Franklin program. And if you don't allocate your money, you don't allocate your voucher, then we can imagine the system would give the money to the political party that you're associated with. That creates a problem for the independents, but you can say that money would go back into the treasury to help fund the system. Okay, so here's the important feature of this system. If we had $50 from every voter, that would produce $6 billion in this system. $6 billion is about three times the amount raised and spent in 2010, $1.8 billion. So that is real money. And the Grant and Franklin program would also avoid the strongest right-wing criticism that is ever made of public funding systems. The right typically says the problem with public funding systems is my money is being used to support speech I don't believe in. But under this system, your money is being used to support your speech, and somebody else's money is being used to support their speech, so nobody's money is being used to support any speech he or she doesn't believe in, it's just the voucher of money you have contributed that's being used to support the speech you do believe in. And then the $100 above that is, of course, your own money too. So it's your money supporting your speech. And it's not some government bureaucrat who's deciding how much money everybody gets. Instead, it's a bottom-up decision of people to allocate their voucher just like people decide to allocate votes. So it's like we have two voting systems. One voting system to give vouchers to candidates and another voting system on election day to choose the candidate that will win the election. But in the system that I'm describing, these two systems of voting are each roughly equal. But the current system we have where we have two systems for voting, one where you give contributions to candidates to get them elected and then vote for them on election day, the first of those two is a radically unequal system where the top 1% do the vast majority of contributions. Now under this Grant and Franklin's program, then again, I think we could imagine a system that would make trust possible because we produce the right kind of dependence and therefore independence inside of Congress. So that's what the promised land looks like it's far away. So what do we do to get there? Well, the hardest thing to accept about this reform campaign is that it probably will take a long time and great effort. But the first step 
is that we breed a class of root strikers. Right, what's a root striker? In 1846, in Walden Pond, Henry David Thoreau, in his book, Walden, wrote this. There are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root, a root striker. And what we need here is root strikers in this debate. People who help others connect the dots. People who get others to recognize that if you care about global warming and you care about getting a sensible health care policy and you care about lower taxes or less regulation, all of you are being blocked by the same corrupting roots. And instead of focusing all of our energy on the thing that we really care about, what we need to do is to step back and recognize until we fix the root, none of us are going to get what we want. So we need to begin to teach this lesson, to teach the lesson that we get nothing until we get this, nothing for the right or the left. And the energy that we've started has been focused in this site that we now call rootstrikers.org, where we have thousands of people who are tagging news stories to link them to this issue of money and politics. Every time there's a news story, it gets tagged. And if you've ever used this wonderful service called Twitter, and I urge you, don't, um, but Twitter, um, you'll see this root striker tag that links to stories that show people the connection between money and politics to make it completely salient and obvious to people this link is there and this link needs to be addressed. We need to teach a link between the branches of evil and the roots, and the link here is this tie to campaign funds. Teach, but as well as teach, we need to find ways to inspire. Now the problem, or the virtue, of our current political system is that presidents are typically the inspiration for significant change. And indeed, presidents, as they get launched, right here in New Hampshire are the inspiration for significant moments of change. And I'll confess, I worked as hard as I could for my friend and former colleague, Barack Obama, to become president, because when he was running for office, this is the sort of thing he said. He said, if we're not willing to take up that fight, the fight to change the way Washington works, then real change, Change that will make a lasting difference in the lives of ordinary Americans will keep getting blocked by the defenders of the status quo. Barack Obama could have said everything I've said here today much more eloquently than I've said it. He believed it, he uttered it again and again and again. But his promise of change was betrayed when he went to Washington. And he settled not for a politics of transformation, but for politics of the same status quo way of getting bills passed through Congress. It was as good as it was going to get, he believed, or at least his advisors believed, and that's the administration he has run. So as we look to 2012, and a campaign where Barack Obama, the man who got to Washington on small dollar contributions, will be raising $1 billion to fund his campaign, largely from $35,000 contributions that he's asking individuals to make through all the indirect ways you can contribute in exchange for having dinner with the president, it will be impossible to imagine that side of the debate, that side of the campaign, focusing on the problem of money and politics. It would be too embarrassing and hubristic even for Washington politicians to say that. But the problem on the right is that there's literally one candidate out there who's talking about this issue. One candidate in the Republican primaries. Buddy Romer, former governor from Louisiana, congressman for eight years, is running a campaign, he'll announce probably this week, for president, and he's made the commitment he will take no more than $100 from anybody, he will take no PAC money, and he will fully disclose every single contribution made. And his campaign website is freetolead.com, and his whole rhetoric is about how we need a president who is, quote, free to lead and not a president who is beholden to the interests that got him into office. Now, I personally disagree with many, many of the policies of, of Buddy Romer, but as I look on the horizon of what possibly could make this change possible, it is only 
right now a candidate like Bucket Buddy Romer who could make this issue salient, and if he made it salient to people like you, I mean New Hampshire people like you, then it would be an issue salient for the rest of the country. He could teach and he could inspire. Now, I'm not optimistic. I've met him, I'm an, I, I, I have enormous respect for him. Um, I invited him to Harvard, he gave an extraordinary speech, much the best uh, speech I've read in the last 15 years addressing this issue. But I don't, I'm not yet convinced he's gonna be able to beat the Republican machine. So instead of thinking about politicians to teach and inspire, I wanna end by getting you to think about the way in which citizens can teach and inspire. And the citizen I want you to focus on for a second is the citizen to help gave us, help give us KEDS. Now, I'm we wearing KEDS tonight. It's right here, it's your KEDS. In honor of this citizen, this is a man who was chairman of Stride Right, Arnie Hyatt. Arnie Hyatt's a shy guy. This is the biggest picture I could find of him on the internet. Um, he's also a loyal Democrat. 1996, he was the second largest contributor to the Democratic Party. So in 1997, Bill Clinton invited him to a dinner at the Mayflower Hotel in Washington with 30 other fat cats <laughs> to tell the president what the president should be doing for the rest of his second term. And each of the fat cats got up to speak, and Arnie was last. We don't have a picture of him actually speaking. I kind of envision it something like this. But <laughs> Arnie stands up and he says to the president, Mr. President, President Clinton, obviously, Mr. President, I know you're an admirer of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So I want you to put yourself in Roosevelt's shoes in 1940, when Roosevelt reluctantly recognized that he needed to convince a reluctant nation to wage a war to save democracy. Because he said, you too, Mr. President, you must convince a reluctant nation to wage a war to save democracy. Not a war against fascists, a war against fat cats, a war against people like us, People who believe merely because we've been successful in the market, we have the right to direct government policy. People who've convinced Americans that our democracy does not work. You can imagine after he's finished with his speech, in this room filled with fat cats, there's a little bit of silence in the room. <laughs> the only published account we have of the evening says that Clinton's response effectively slashed Hyatt to pieces, humiliating him in front of the group. Now, 15 years later, it's time that we recognize that Arnold Hyatt that night was right, that we do need to convince a reluctant nation to wage a war to save democracy, and the president was wrong. But where Hyatt was wrong was in his belief that politicians would lead us there. It's not politicians who are gonna lead us there, it's citizens. It's us, it's root strikers, it's you. MSNBC's Cenk Uygur gave a speech at Netroots Nation last month where he said, there is only one issue in America, one issue in America, campaign finance reform. Cenk is a root striker. So must we all become. Now, I have one more story and then I'm going to stop. So I'm sure all of you remember the events around March 24th, 1989, when a ship under the command of Joseph Hazelwood ran aground and spilled 11 million gallons of oil into the Prince William's, William Sound. This is Joe Hazelwood reporting the accident.
Uh, we're going to be here a while if you want, so you're notified. Over. Now, as that recording suggests, there was a question about Captain Hazelwood's state of mind at the time of the accident. There was an allegation he had been drinking. He said he'd only had four vodkas before he'd gotten on the ship. The blood alcohol said he must have had at least six times the legal limit when he got on board. He denied it. His lawyers fought it. There was an extraordinary battle in court, which eventually he was able to deflect the charge that he was intoxicated. So there might be doubt about whether on that night he was intoxicated. But what there's no doubt about is that he had a severe problem with alcohol. He was Yeltsin. His mother said, I do know that he had a problem with alcohol in the past. Exxon in 1985 had treated him for his problem with alcohol. 1989, the president said he thought Hazelwood had mastered the problem. But in 1986, he'd had his driver's license revoked for a DUI. And in 1988, again, had his driver's license revoked for a DUI. At the time, he was captaining a super tanker. He was not legally entitled to drive a VW Beetle. But forget Hazelwood. Put him aside. Think about those around him. Think about the other officers who could have picked up a phone while a drunk was driving a super tanker. Think about the people who did nothing. What do we think about them? Now, I ask that question because when I think about this issue of corruption, of good souls' corruption, what I think is that we are they. There are critical problems affecting our society, requiring serious attention, but we have institutions incapable of attention. They are distracted. They are distracted and unable to focus, like pilots playing on their laptop while flying a 747, or a surgeon flirting while conducting surgery, or half of you on your cell phone when driving down a highway. There are critical problems that require serious attention, but none of these institutions are capable of that attention. And who is to blame for that? Who is responsible? It's not the evil souls of the Blagojeviches. It's not the evil people alone. It's good people. It's decent people. It's the people who could pick up a phone. It's us. We, the most privileged, need to fix this. Because the most outrageous part is that these corruptions have been primed by the most privileged in our society, but permitted by the passivity of the privileged as well, permitted by us. When Franklin walked out of the Constitutional Convention, a woman stopped him and said, Mr. Franklin, what have you wrought? Franklin said, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. A republic, a representative democracy, a democracy dependent upon the people alone, we have lost that republic. We need to act to get it back. Thank you very much.